Hi, Rick Jacoby, Sugar Crush, and now the rest of the story. We have a Texan here today. You're from Texas yes. too, Susan? Well, Dr. Nathan Bryan, um, you know you won yesterday. I, I was did. A, yeah. Uh, and I, I think it was a, a good game. You, you had a good team. And, uh, we had Diamond, two really good Texas teams. You did, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you nailed it this year. But you went to the U- University of Texas as well. I did. I went to the University of Texas as an undergrad, got a degree in biochemistry, and the rest is history. This is going to be exciting. <laughs> so a Texan talking about nitric oxide. Um, I'll tell you a funny story with Texan, University of Texas. So I was on a trip years ago to Egypt and, um, in, in front, with Dartmouth, and it was, it was a great trip. It was about two weeks. We went to the pyramids and went all over the place, and we went to Jordan. And, and then at the end of the trip, we went to the, the burning bush, the um, mount, mm-hmm. um, and, and I'm there, and the number one priest at this monastery, and I hear a, a Texas accent, and, I, and I, I went up to him. I said, where are you from? He said, <laughs> UT. And he went, of course, like I'm born. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're, you guys are all over the place. Well, you know, they say what starts here changes the world. That's right. The there we go. Well, this is an interesting subject for our, for our audience. Uh, nitric oxide, just to <clears throat> frame this question, uh, and Dr. Murad, who uh, apparently you work with, I think, mm-hmm. at UT. Uh, so we'd like to hear that backstory, how you got involved with nitric oxide. My good friend, um, Dr. Cook, yeah. uh, he got me in, interested in nitric oxide when he was at Stanford. So this is a big part of my puzzle for Sugar Crush. I think it's the first molecule that interrupts the nitric oxide pathway for the autonomic nervous system. But I want to hear your background, how you got into biochemistry in mm-hmm. the first place and um, how you got in uh, with bi- nitric oxide. Well, you know, it's like every career, it's a journey, right? And so you, things happen in your life and you pivot and you take a new direction. But, you know, I've always been interested in science and medicine, uh, excelled in high school, graduated top of my class, and I went to the University of Texas and had a chance to do undergraduate biochemistry. And this was in the early 90s when protein overexpression in bacteria and isolation was making its way. And so I fell in love with basic science research and this feeling of discovery. And I got a degree in biochemistry and quickly realized that the job market for a bachelor's degree in biochemistry wasn't stellar. It's really hard to make a living. So I knew I had to go and further my education. And I enrolled at LSU School of Medicine in their PhD program in molecular and cellular physiology. <clears throat> and a Nobel Prize had just been awarded for the discovery of nitric oxide. And fortunately, one of the guys who won the Nobel Prize came and gave a lecture at the medical school. His name was Lou Ignaro. So I had a chance to have a conversation with him, have dinner with him that night, and really just opened up my mind to this entire new concept of gaseous signaling molecules regulating vasoreactivity, blood pressure, sexual function, inflammation. So we knew it was a very important molecule, but we didn't know how the human body made it. We didn't know how to make nitric oxide-based therapies, or even how to detect nitric oxide deficiency in patients. So really, for the next two and a half years, I finished my PhD in, I guess, a little under two years, two and a half years. And then we developed methods that could detect nitric oxide gas in biological systems. And then from there, I went to Boston Medical Center and uh, did a cardiology fellowship there for two years. And then I was, uh, we made a number of discoveries. We were publishing 10 to 12 papers a year in nitric oxide. And Fred Murad, one of the other guys who shared the Nobel Prize, was familiar with my work, and so he recruited me to join the faculty of UT Medical School in Houston as an assistant professor in the Institute of Molecular Medicine. So we were charged with understanding human disease, the mechanism of human disease, to the extent that we could develop rational therapies. So everything I've been doing since my original PhD work through 15 years of uh, on faculty at UT has been trying to develop safe and effective nitric oxide-based therapeutics. The challenge was nitric oxide is a gas that's produced in the body. Then once it's produced, it's gone in less than a second. So how do we deliver bioactive gas in solid dose form that recapitulates endogenous signaling? And that's been the major challenge in nitric oxide drug development for the past 
30 years. And we've cracked the code on that, and we are still the only people that make a solid dose form of bioactive gas. That's a really interesting uh, concept because that has been the challenge. Now, we kind of got together because of Dr. Dellen, who is a surgeon with his uh, decompression surgery. Right. So he's the guy who taught me diabetic treatment with surgery, which is, you know, considered <clears throat> evil, even t- t- today. So each person that comes at a problem comes at a different angle. And he's a plastic surgeon, and you know the backstory on yep. this, because our audience probably doesn't know this, but he had a patient with carpal tunnel and ulnar tunnel at the elbow, and he did this for a patient. The patient said, well, why don't you do my legs? I have you know, pain, numbness, tingling, all the hallmarks of uh, diabetic neuropathy. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, that's a different disease. And he went, well, is it? <laughs> right. So, but this is, um, this is in the 80s, actually in the early 80s. And he went to the laboratory. And, and have you ever met Dr. Dellen? I don't believe I have. I've well, attended a lot of these extremative neurosurgeon it, meetings. But right. I think he's going to be there this year. But <clears throat> he has similar background that you do in the, uh, looking at a problem from a very specific angle. And he's unique in that ability. He's written... 800 papers, two textbooks. He's the guy. So he teaches me about 25 years ago. And and he said, you got to read my textbook. I did. And it really didn't make a lot of sense to me because I couldn't see what he was seeing. And then when I went down to Johns Hopkins and trained with him, and he said, well, you got to put these lenses on. Yeah. Magnification. Put the lenses on. He's looking at the nerve, which I could not see without the lens because they're so tiny. Mm -hmm. And we decompress these nerves and the feeling comes back. Mm. Well, you can't see. First of all, the mind cannot know what you cannot see. And once you see that and know that process, which you're doing with nitric oxide, then it's an epiphany. Then all of a sudden you're all in on this problem. Back, Back to Murad. Um, when they did that experiment, tell the audience how that was done. Because Dr. Cook explained that to me. And it's such a simple concept, how they came about that with the aortic ring. Yeah, well, that was from the aortic ring. That was Bob Furchcott's experiment. So he was with three guys who shared the Nobel Prize. Bob Furchcott, Lou Ignaro, and Fred Murad. Fred was the first one to really open up this whole field of nitric oxide. Because he, in 1977, had published that drugs like nitroglycerin worked for the treatment of acute angina because they were metabolized into nitric oxide, dilated the coronary arteries, and relieved the ischemic pain known as angina. So that was a very important uh, National Academy of Science paper in 1977. So then he created this concept of nitrovasodilator. So everything, any nitrogen-based molecule he would throw at an enzyme prep for soluble guanylate cyclase would activate this enzyme and lead to cyclic GMP and smooth muscle relaxation. But it was, it was Bob Furchcott who did the aortic rings. So he took blood vessels from... I think it was either rats or rabbits, and put them between two force transducers and would give an agonist like acetylcholine. And sometimes it would relax, sometimes it would dilate. And what he quickly realized was that sometimes his lab technician, his name was Zawadzki, wouldn't take great care to preserve the integrity of the endothelial cells. And when he was sloppy, when he'd asked acetylcholine, it would constrict. When he was very careful to preserve the endothelium, when he'd add acetylcholine, it would relax. So in his 1980 Nature paper, he called this endothelium-derived relaxing factor, or right. EDRF. Yep. So we have to have a functional, intact endothelium in our blood vessels in order to get nitric oxide produced that relaxes the blood vessel. Right. So that was, I think, still one of the most important discoveries in vascular biology. But we didn't know what EDRF was. Right. It was this elusive molecule. Right. So for our audience, what he did, he, sometimes he held the ring with his fingers like that, other times he held it like that. So he had two different results. Yeah. And he was er- erasing the endothelium. So the endothelium is that tissue, and it's only one cell thick. That's right. And the gas only expresses for a couple of seconds, and, the, and as you said, it's, in a second it's gone. So what? It, that's why it was almost like Syndrome X. So these <laughs> parallel thoughts. Uh, and X-ray. And I always thought, okay, it's unknown. 
So you're working on x-rays and you're handling x-rays and your fingers fall off. Oh, there must be something here. And when you do that with your hand, you erase the endothelium. You can't produce nitric oxide, that signal, and doesn't relax the vessel right. and the muscle around it. In fact, you get a, a paradoxical vasoconstriction. Exactly. So that, that's, a, that's a big deal. It's a very big deal. It explains the etiology of every major age-related chronic disease. Loss of blood flow, increased inflammation, immune dysfunction, and oxidative stress. All that's controlled and by nitric that's oxide. that's where you and I connect with nitric oxide and the autonomic nervous system. So let's, let's circle back for Dr. Dellen and hit in his defense. So he's working on the chemistry that produces the constriction that diabetes causes with two other pathways, the polyol pathway, uh, which is um, sugar inside a nerve producing sorbitol and making it hydrophilic, pulling That's water right. into the nerve. And the other one is the malleolar re reaction where sugar plus proteins like shrink wrap, it's constrict constricting the nerve. When I work with him, that was after the Nobel Prize 97, I think it was given, but Dellen's papers were not written with what you had, what your knowledge was yep. uh, about. So there's two parallel tracks going on here. And back to Dr. Cook. So this was makes this conversation, or at least for me. And so here's Dr. Cook. And when he was at Stanford at the time, and I said to Dr. Dellen, I think there's more to your theory. I understood those other two theories. I could see now the constriction physically, what sugar caused, but it seemed to me there was something else. So he said, why don't you figure it out? So I, that's not my field for sure. <laughs> now, I like biochemistry. I, I don't know if I told you that I worked with when I was in undergraduate school and then in, in podiatric medical school in Philadelphia. I worked at Ben Franklin Clinic. I was a research assistant for Dr. Michael Sheff, and he was the research assistant for Watson and Crick. Oh, yeah, and we were working on PKU, yeah. which is another segue to your theory. <clears throat> I fed the rats. That's what I did. <laughs> and I fed different chows. When I th and I think back and I went, wait a minute. We were feeding carnivores, rats, uh, chows. Well, they don't eat that stuff, but that's for dinner, and that's the experiment. One had more sugar and the one didn't, and, and we used a bench electrophoresis in those days. You Back probably, in the good old days. No, we did those. You did? Yeah. yeah. He wanted Scott paper towels and electric. I, I remember the whole thing. But we were looking for the answer, and the answer actually has been, is known now, BH4. That's yeah. the answer to PKU. Now, I didn't know that at the time, and even if I did, I wouldn't have recognized it. But the point is, these X, the unknowns that we're looking for, and people think, well, yeah, that makes sense. Well, makes sense take, now. Yeah. it makes sense now, right. So now back to Dr. Cook. So I find his article in circulation in 2004, and I went, hmm, that's interesting. So I text Dr. Cook, and I said, hey, Dr. Cook, Dellen has a theory. I think your theory fits his. And he called me like two hours after I text him, which is pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. And he said, come up to Stanford and let's take a look at his molecule. And that molecule is asymmetric dimethyl arginine and semi-essential amino acid. So the methyl group is on one side. And I think, why? Simple thing like that, like omega-3, omega-6, mm -hmm. you know, double bind. How could that have that profound effect what it does so that blocks the nitric oxide pathway so i theorized that that molecule was the first molecule blocking the nitric oxide pathway but at that time it, it was not and there were a couple articles and they they did test adma that's the acronym for that and it did not block the nitric oxide pathway but i read the papers they were using nerve conduction well, yeah. autonomic is small fiber neuropathy, and that was another conundrum in 2004. Small fiber neuropathy and large fiber neuropathy were, were considered separate and distinct diseases in 2004. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense, like Tangier's disease. Yes, it can exist, but there's like 50 people in the world. Now we have, everybody has small fiber neuropathy because yeah. it's the beginning, 
And this is why your molecule and your technology and your approach to this is so fundamentally important because it's 40 years before you get large fiber compression that Dr. Dellen talks about. So let's really do a deep dive yep. on your technology, what products you've come up with, and why it's essential way before you have the diagnosis of right. um, neuropathy because it may be migraine headaches. It could be anything, anything in the autonomic nervous system. I think even AFib yeah. and all these things are all interrelated to that process. So let's do the deep dive. Well, let's, I mean, mechanistically, we know exactly what causes every major chronic disease that humans are faced with today. We do a, barely, a very poor job of managing that because physicians don't have the tools they need to prescribe the medications to get to the root cause. That's the gap we're hoping to fill. So when you look at things like neuropathy, so you made a very good, um, you know, there's nerve conductance, right? There has to be an action potential that follows along that nerve fiber. That action potential is mediated by the ability of that nerve to be perfused. How well supplied by blood, the blood vessels is that nerve fiber? Mm -hmm. So we know the earliest stages of neuropathy is insufficient blood supply. So when the nerve fibers don't get blood supply, they can't initiate an action potential, they develop neuropathy, and then you get the tingling, the pain, and the whole progression of disease. And it's the same thing that happens in vascular dementia and Alzheimer's, right? When you can't regulate blood flow to the brain, same thing that happens with erectile dysfunction. If you can't regulate blood flow to the sex organs, you develop dysfunction. And if the dysfunction isn't restored or resolved, you develop full-blown disease. So everything we know about metabolic disease, peripheral neuropathy, Alzheimer's, ischemic heart disease, liver disease, it's all manifested by endothelial dysfunction or the inability of the blood vessels to produce nitric oxide and perfuse those organs upon demand and the individual tissues and cells. So what we do now is we, we create technology that if your body can't make nitric oxide, then we do it for you. And that's, okay. that's a very simple concept. Right? Well, that's a simple and important concept. So... When I was writing about this in my book, Sugar Crush, I said the same thing you, you are elucidating. I called the compression throughout the body the global compression theory, taking Dellen's theory, adding in the nitric oxide, Alzheimer's, autism, MS, doesn't matter. Right. They're all the same mechanism, different nerves, so we have labels, we stick on them as if they're different or diseases. Syndromes. <laughs> yeah, then we get the syndrome, and then it gets really confusing. No, they're all the same disease, different locations, mm -hmm. yeah. different manifestations. So I, I looked, actually, when we were doing the research with Dr. Cook, I used his molecule, measured it against my patient population. We had about 160 patients. MS was a pretty high number in the fifth quintile of uh, AD May. And I thought, well, that makes sense. I mean, a diabetic is not going to just have their biochemistry effect peripheral nerves that they don't and here's another thing because i'm we're, we're big into <laughs> stem cells now oh, yeah. or i am my new book is about stem cells and nitric oxide and how you can uh, resolve this problem non-surgically and nitric oxide is essential if you're going to get stem cells you have to have blood supply or you're That's just right. wasting your money right. so i mean it's all it's it's all so interrelated we have to get dr Dellen. And Dr. Cook and you on a podcast together because the intersection of your thinking is the answer to this whole conundrum of yeah, I agree. Uh, you're talking about diabetes like it's unsolvable. It's, um, yes. it's the easiest disease to, un, to unravel. Yeah, that's right. Once you get to your lens on the problem, Dr. Dellen's lens on the problem. Now, I don't know if you've talked to John Cook Recently, you know, he's at, well, you probably know that. He's, yeah, a, he's method. a Methodist. And now he's into stem cells, uh, pluripotent, inducible stem cells. And what his way of thinking, at least the way he expresses to me, because he's a vascular biologist as well, the pereocyte was really what Arnold Kaplan is calling an MSC. It's, okay. it's the same thing. And VEGF is that growth factor and Ian White, you know, Ian yeah. White. Yeah. So his feeling, and I like his approach, the nerve is searching in the darkness for the void, so to speak, to tell the body that it needs blood supply. 
That's right. And it sends that pereocyte down with a signal from one of the growth factors, and I think VEGF is a powerful one in this. Sure. And, and, and you put in exosomes and, you know, the rest of the story. But if you don't have blood flow, you're not going to you're not going to change the story. Well, yeah, it's not. I mean, nitric oxide is the molecule that tells our own stem cells to mobilize and differentiate. Yep. Right. So if you can't, if your body can't make nitric oxide, the stem cells don't get the signal to go and repair and replace tissue. And let's, two, and then these people let's that let's repeat are, that because this is really fundamental. Because my, yeah. I'm talking about sugar all the time. I'm talking about stem cells, but I have not emphasized the importance of what you're saying. Now, tell me those products because that is it. Absolutely. You're just wasting your money and time to think if you're eating high dose sugar diet and you're not producing nitric oxide, you're not, you're just, you're just going to waste your money. So what are those products? Tell the public how we can get those products. Well, we make products that actually generate nitric oxide gas. So every product we bring to market, we quantify, detect, and verify that it releases nitric oxide. So we do this in the form of a lozenge. So the, the parent company is called Numa Nitric Oxide. The brand of products is called N101. So N101.com. That's the letter N, the number one, the letter O, number one, dot com. So we make an orally disintegrating tablet. You put this lozenge in your mouth, and as soon as it uh, makes contact with your saliva, it starts generating nitric oxide gas. So at amounts that recapitulate endogenous NO production, we know how much nitric oxide a healthy 20-year-old makes over 24 hours, and we basically release that through that lozenge. So that's number one. It's vasoactive. Uh, and then we, we understand the biochemistry and the enzymology of the enzyme in the endothelium, in the lining of the blood vessels. So we recouple that enzyme. So now we've improved the body's ability to make nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessels. And we're finding that we're restoring the oral microbiome that's responsible for producing nitric oxide. So that lozenge does three things. One, if your body can't make nitric oxide, we do it for you. Number two, it recouples the NOS enzyme and it restores the oral microbiome. So now we've replenished the body's ability to make nitric oxide on its own. He's a biochemist. Oh, you heard that NOS. So NOS I was at a, yeah, I was at a meeting, BH4 Society meeting. That was like, and they were from it's a very <clears throat> small society, but they were from India, China, everywhere. Oh, yeah. And of course, they used NOS nitric oxide synthase, because if it, it's that acronym, biochemists like you, just slides off your tongue. <laughs> now you're from India and you hear, or ENOS, and, and, and I'm at this meeting, I'm saying, what are they saying? Is ENOS and, you know, <laughs> and all these different acronyms, because it's, it's exhausting to say the whole word. So... Nitric oxide synthase. So let's go to that yeah. enzyme. There's, I know them as three enzymes, or maybe there's more now. There's three isoforms. Yeah. Isoforms. So we have neuronal, constitutional, and the inducible. So I assume you're talking about the inducible? No, so there's, there's different regulations of both the constitutive, which is enos and enos, and the inducible, which is induced by cytokines and during inflammation, acute inflammation. So what we control, what we try to control and regulate is the constitutive because those enzymes are responsible for the second-to-second -second regulation of blood flow and down-regulating adhesion molecules and lining of the blood vessel, mitigating inflammation and preventing oxidative stress and immune dysfunction. Down-regulating down adhesive molecule. That's, That's right. an important concept no, that right is, there. I mean, over the past four years, it's become really important, right, because the spike protein is what binds to... The ACE receptors causes activation of the inflammation, activating platelets, increase in D-dimers, microclots, long COVID. Everything we know about COVID disease and long COVID is due to the spike protein binding to the endothelial cells, causing the inflammation. Nitric oxide actually downregulates that and activates the immune system to prevent the virus from replicating. So all, everything we've learned about COVID is COVID disease is a manifestation of nitric oxide deficiency. People who get sick and die from COVID are the people who can't make nitric oxide. Exactly. And they're diabetics yep. for the most part. Hypertensive, previous yeah. heart attacks. 97% of the people who died at our hospital were diabetics, although a lot of them didn't know they were diabetic. I, I get this all the time from patients. I said, when did you become a diabetic? Oh, when I had my heart attack and I was in the hospital. <laughs> no, you discovered that you are a diabetic. Right. It did not cause that. 
So the cardiology aspect of this and long COVID is enormous story. But why does the public not know this? I mean, in my book, I talked about it, not knowing that viruses were really doing that. I, this, this is what I say from my years way back. Viruses are people too. They're just trying to raise their family. They want a good <laughs> meal a of sugar. Of and that's what they do. So they find a lung cell that's loaded up with sugar. And that spike protein is good papers that is glycosylated. And they're going to see that and they're going, yum. Here's yeah. a, here's a, a Peter Piper. Here's a Peter <laughs> Piper. Here we go. <clears throat> and we're going to stop in and have a Coke along with it. And you'll have a cytokine storm. The white cells are going to come out and you're going to have a big fight. And down regulates nitric oxide. And if it down regulates, O2 levels fall and you die mm -hmm. because you can't exchange oxygen. But what do we do during the crisis? We put ventilators on them. That's a cruel thing to do, I would think. You can't exchange oxygen. You can expand and contract your lungs, but yep. you, can't you can't exchange the oxygen. Right. So let's, let's talk about that <clears throat> treatment-wise. Obviously, number one, don't eat the poison, sugar. Mm -hmm. Number two, you have to get nitric oxide. Now, that's a really good message you have there because long COVID, that's a... Do you have some, some papers on that for long COVID and nitric oxide? Yeah, there's been some really good reviews written on kind of the vascular inflammatory component of long COVID and even the mechanism of attachment and COVID infection. So everything we know about long COVID and COVID infection can be described or explained by a lack of nitric oxide. So in healthy people who make a lot of nitric oxide or sufficient nitric oxide, when we get exposed to a virus... Right? Our immune system recognizes that if we have good circulation, we mobilize our immune response. The immune cells go to the site of attachment, generate a lot of nitric oxide, shut down virus replication, and we don't get sick. You know, I've never had COVID. And I was in, up, I've been on an airplane every week since mid-2020. At the time we had our drug studies, we had 26 COVID clinics around the U.S. I was in COVID clinics, exposed to COVID patients. I didn't wear a mask, and yet I never got COVID. So why is that? Well, my immune system is robust, and we just deal with it. But if you can't make nitric oxide, number one, you have poor circulation, so you can't mobilize your immune cells. Your immune cells are dysfunctional, so they can't make a lot of nitric oxide to shut down the virus from replicating. The virus replicates, propagates throughout the body. You get sick. You lose blood oxygen saturation. You got a mismatch in ventilation to perfusion in the lungs, and they put you on a mechanical vent, cause acidosis, and you die. Mm -hmm. The mechanism is very clear, and everything they did clinically during COVID led to unnecessary deaths. So what we, we had a different approach. Let's develop an early stage therapy where if we catch these COVID patients early on, before they get a drop in blood oxygen saturation, within 72 hours of onset of symptoms or diagnosis, let's give them our nitric oxide drug and then prevent the inflammatory response, prevent the drop in oxygen saturation. You keep patients out of the hospital. If you keep them out of the hospital, you typically keep them alive. So that was our approach, and we find that we could match ventilation to perfusion, we could improve blood oxygen saturation, but it was very difficult enrolling patients. One, it was because it was very fear-based in the media. People thought if they got COVID, they immediately had to go to the hospital, they were admitted, and we know the result of that. Yeah, and the way you just explained it, it's so, it's so logical. Um, and when and a lot of people, you know, they don't like biochemistry, and it's just a different language of a way to think about something. Um, but it's all about counting electrons, right? No one likes to count electrons. Well, but it's how the body works. It, it's, all, it's, it's energy medicine. It's, it's electron well, flow. He's got his PhD in that. I mean, I'm just a, you know, trying to apply biochemistry as a surgeon, which is kind of, I, I get that look, you know, like, what are you talking about? Nitric oxide and you're talking about surgery. Because the bottom line is, it's just what you said. If you don't have blood, you're not going to get a, right. you're not going to get a good result. You have to restore that. Right. So now we get into this whole thing. Neuropathy is caused by this, that, or the other thing. It's, it's a, a, a symphony of things that come together to cause that disease or any, any disease. How about epigenetics? Have you looked at the epigenetics of these things? Of uh, Does nitric oxide have anything to do with the expression of genes in the epigenetic world? You know, we published a proteomics paper probably back in 2003 and four, and we looked at 
when we give nitric oxide, what genes are upregulated, what downregulates, and most of the enzyme systems involved in metabolism, mitochondria, are affected and influenced by nitric oxide. So when we look at mitochondrial biogenesis, when we look at mitochondrial efficiency of oxygen utilization to make ATP, all of that's controlled by nitric oxide. So, you know, things like caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, sirtuins, all lead to mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial uh, improved efficiency. But all of those pathways are dependent upon nitric oxide. So if the cell can't make nitric oxide, you're not going to get mitochondrial biogenesis from caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, sirtuins. The cell has to make nitric oxide to induce PGC1 alpha, and then that leads to mitochondrial biogenesis. So there's a number of epigenetic modifications by nitric oxide, both downregulating the bad guys, upregulating the protective uh, guys. Now, we were on a um, symposium a couple of weeks ago in Newport Beach, <clears throat> and it was the nitric oxide was a big topic there, how to measure it, how to induce it. Um, there, there's a company called MedWatch, and they were measuring glucose with optical scanning. And I, I assume they're going to be able to look at nitric oxide and asymmetric dimethyl arginine and any molecule that has a signature. I would think they would be able to measure that. Because glucose, let's go back to glucose, nitric oxide. Once your glucose is elevated, it's probably been elevated for a long period of time. There is a fellow that I brought to the Association of Extremity Nurse Surgeons. This is in 2011. Melvin Hayden, are you familiar with his name? I don't think so. So he's a guy who looks under electron microscope for his research at University of Missouri. But he's written a great paper in the circulation of um, pancreas that diabetes is a conformational disease and redux stress, misfolds the insulin, and that's why we have this downregulation constantly with excesses of um, glucose. Then we get the hyperinsulinemia, and finally really becomes a space-occupying lesion. Right. It just can't produce the effect. It doesn't read correctly. So... Nitric oxide is, plays such an important role in just about anything you, you have that discussion with. I talked about in my book with um, Poswell's, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Poswell's theorem, where R to the fourth power, if you remember that. Oh, yeah, for regulation of blood flow. Yeah. Dynamics, yeah. So I applied that to nitric oxide. So... With the audience, what that means is is hemodynamic flow, and there's a lot of variables. The most important, I thought, was the radius. So radius to the fourth power. 19% reduction in the radius equals a 50% reduction in flow. That's and I read that, and I went, that doesn't make sense until you really look at the math and you go, oh, my God, it's true. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of other variables, but they don't have as much influence as that. So... Back to the formula of nitric oxide production from L-arginine and all the cofactors, ADMA, downregulating, and then BH4 also helps to produce nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. And if you don't produce nitric oxide, you're going to produce the opposite peroxy nitrate. Or well, superoxide, yeah. Superoxide. So that affects the... R4 and that theorem. So you're going to have less blood s supply. So when we have these, or I do have these arguments, you're a professor, so I have to argue sometimes, <laughs> you know, who are you and what do you, what do you know? Well, when I look at that, I said, well, it's a simple equation. If you don't have blood, for whatever reason, you're going to have necrosis. And if you don't restore that, I don't care you're the best surgeon in the world, it's not going to resolve that. Right. And all the medicines, all these monoclonal antibodies, all they are is, in my opinion, is reducing the inflammation so you can eat more sugar. Mm -hmm. That's really what it amounts to. Now, you're, I understand uh, you're from Texas, so you have a ranch and you a bull rider? Is that what I heard? No, I'm a team roper. Team roper. So you're obviously in great shape. It's diet, it's exercise, and it's not as complicated as 
we kind of make it sometimes when we have these conversations. It sounds very complicated. Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's, a, it's a complex, complicated science, but the solution is really simple, right? Because I tell people, we understand how the body makes nitric oxide. We understand what goes wrong in people that can't make it. We know the clinical consequences, and most importantly, we know how to fix it. So and what is that? Let's talk about it. It's very, very simple. It is. So it's two things. Stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production. Number two, start doing the things that promote it. So what is that? Just like you said, you got to eliminate sugar. Sugar glycates the NOS enzyme, renders it dysfunctional, oxidizes BH4, uncouples the NOS. And the thing we discovered probably 10 years ago was mouthwash. Mouthwash kills the oral microbiome, yep. causes an increase in blood pressure. Uh, fluoride, fluoride in, uh, in toothpaste, fluoride in municipal water. It's an antiseptic. It kills the bacteria in your mouth, destroys the microbiome. It's a neurotoxin, and it destroys your thyroid function. So you have to eliminate. The, the pineal body to the nitric oxide, because the fluoride is calcifying that, and, yeah. which is no, a fluoride, crystal. Fluoride is a very toxic molecule, and unfortunately it's... It's in mouthwash, it's in toothpaste, it's in most municipal water systems. So you gotta, wow. you got to eliminate fluoride. What a great conversation. And then two, it's, huh? uh, the three, it's antacids. Oh, yes. You know, and antacids that... completely shut down nitric oxide production, specifically proton pump inhibitors. And this is some of the work of John Cook. You know, he published, I believe in 2015, people that have been on proton pump inhibitors for three to five years had a 35% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke because they're increasing ADMA. Yes. And then a study last month showed that people have been on PPIs for four years had a 40% increase in Alzheimer's, vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. Let's talk about Alzheimer's because yep. that's a big subject in my book. Yep. So using Dellen's compression theory and extrapolating, I'm saying all nerves are the same, although that's a cranial nerve, but it still has the same process. Uh, and it's going to get compressed. So I've always said that you look at the symptom, follow the symptom up the river, so to speak, and s see which nerve is primary to that quote-unquote diagnosis, yep. and that's the olfactory nerve. So you have the olfactory nerve, mouthwash, that's going to get in that nerve. Um, it's going to affect the nitric oxide pathway, the proton pump inhibitors, specifically B12, and that's part of BH4. Yeah. So we get all these down regulators. And Steve Forbes had an article last year um, he was calling the scandalous uh, from Forbes magazine that the solution to Alzheimer's was scandalous that we haven't been able to figure it out. <laughs> but we're throwing drugs at it, and I understand that's where the money is. But the cause is what we just talked about. That's right. So it doesn't matter if it's your olfactory nerve or your vagus nerve or MS. I'm going to just touch on autism because I think maybe you and I should talk about it. And we don't drive this audience crazy here because we'll, de we'll get so far in the, in the weeds. But I've looked at that. It's the hypoglossal nerve, basically. It innervates the tongue. But at age or the mom's gestation at eight. At day 22 to day 24, there's a protein that's not produced. At the area of the olive in embryology, this is written by an embryologist, day 22 to day 24, and it was 1.1 millimeter smaller space where the hypoglossal neuron formed. And I said to myself, I'm, now, of course, I'm reading these papers with Dellen's lens on. That's right. Completely different perspective. Network. And, and see, and then you add on your lens and Cook's lens of biochemistry, and it comes into focus. Let's, and that's why I think I can read papers rather quickly, as, as I'm sure you do too. You know what you're looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like going through an insurance policy. Is the flood covered uh, if it comes in through the window? No, nope. it's <laughs> roof. Okay, there's the answer. And biochemistry is pretty much the same thing. So you got to know what you're looking for. you got to have that inquisitive mind. So now I'm looking at it through different lenses, one of which is yours. And I looked at autism and I was saying, wait a minute, this is a preconception problem. There's one in 20 births right now that are autistic. When I started looking at this 25 years ago, it was 16 per 10,000. Nitric oxide has to be part of this equation on the parents. Russian roulette, epigenetics, you have the genes expressed. 
with that diet, a uh, hypoglycemic diet, carbohydrate, diabetic yep. diet, and you're going to upregulate or downregulate that gene that expresses for that protein at that spot. Now you have compression. Now you have an autistic kid. I don't think the nitric oxide has been looked at from that point of view. So no, that, not in, I mean, we've done some studies kind of anecdotal in uh, severe and profound autism spectrum disorders. So these are nonverbal self-mutilating kids. Uh, we gave them our nitric oxide and for, I think, 30 or 60 days. It was at a, a clinic up in New, New York, uh, Manhattan, maybe. And these kids became somewhat verbal, and they stopped the self-mutilation. So, I mean, this wasn't really an objective study. It was more subjective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very difficult to do clinical trials in kids, especially kids with autism. But let's go back to Alzheimer's, because that we know exactly what causes Alzheimer's. And we're, we're developing uh, drug therapy specifically for Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is, is basically characterized by hypoperfusion of the brain, focal ischemia, prefrontal cortex, inflammation, oxidative stress, immune dysfunction, and insulin resistance. So when we get, and the reason Alzheimer's drugs have failed is because the target is wrong. Right. It's not the tau tangles. It's right. not the amyloid. Those are consequences of disease. They're not the cause of disease. Right. So any drug therapy that goes after tau or amyloid will fail just because of the consequence of disease. So what we do is we get to the root cause. And we've done this through spec scans and functional MRIs. If we give our nitric oxide drug, we can improve cerebral perfusion. We can improve glucose uptake because in insulin signaling, when insulin binds to the insulin receptors, it starts all these signaling cascades. And then we get GLUT4 translocation to bind glucose and clear it from the circulation. Well, the signal that tells insulin, insulin tells GLUT4 to translocate and bind glucose through the production of nitric oxide. But in diabetics... With insulin resistance, they can't make that nitric oxide, so GLUT4 never gets the signal. You can't clear glucose from the circulation. It tells your pancreas to secrete more insulin. Now you get hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, all the inflammatory components of diabetes, and it's all because the cell can't make nitric oxide. So when we give nitric oxide or restore the cell's ability to make nitric oxide, now you potentiate insulin signaling. GLUT4 gets the signal, clears glucose from the circulation, get better management of hyperglycemia, and you get downregulation of the insulin production. So you get better glucose uptake, you perfuse the brain, and it gets to the root cause of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. That's the solution. It's, it's it is, and it, and it probably is a solution for any neurodegenerative disease. That's right. Any disease. I don't think there's a single clinical indication where nitric oxide at the right dose at the right time would not be beneficial. So in summary, this has been exciting, you know? Yeah, it's... It's life changing, and I just and, and and that's why what you do is so important because, you know, I tried to teach this when I was in medical school, teaching in medical school, future physicians this, and there's so much resistance to changing the curriculum of how we train future physicians in their education, because you learn biochemistry and physiology your first year, second year you learn phar pharmacology, and then billing, and you know that's how the, the financial system of, of medicine Unfortunately, works. Unfortunately, so that you forget everything you learned about physiology and biochemistry because. Once you make a diagnosis, you have finite things you can do to get paid on that diagnosis. Or you're outside the standard of care and you can become sanctioned. You, you should get a hold of Steve Forbes. Tell him yeah. you do have a solution. And it is scandalous. Tell the audience where they can get your product. Well, I'm not here to... I typically don't try to sell products, right? I try to provide education and information and correct a lot of the misinformation out there in the nitric oxide field. So I tell people to go to my educational website. It's drnathansbryan.com. We've got some, I do a monthly blog. We've got videos. Uh, and then I'm on social media. But for our products, people who want safe and effective nitric oxide product technology, it's n101.com. We make a lozenge. We make a fermented bead powder for energy and pre-workout. We've developed a whole skincare line of products. Um, and so it's really the work of Susan Schaefer, the president of the company, that, that makes this work. You know, I'm the science. I'm the innovator. And we bring these products together, and then we create, you know, really the education. Really what we are, we're an education company. We want to provide consumers and really the masses an awareness around nitric oxide. But more importantly, how can they find a nitric oxide product that actually works? Right. And differentiate our technology from all the other, pardon my French, but the, the crap out there that doesn't work. And that's and a problem. A yeah. Well, Susan, I didn't give you a lot of time that's on this. Okay. 
And so you're the president of the company, and the company is? Pneuma nitric oxide. Okay, perfect. Um, so Pneuma is Greek for breath of life. It's Greek for? Breath of life. Yes, yeah, so Pneuma, Pneuma was a, a term um, coined by Galen. I Galen agree. was the physician back in probably 20 AD, uh, or maybe even BC, some along that time. But he, he created this concept of there was a gas that animated the human. In right? the, in the, in yeah, the, and it was pneuma, the breath of life. Yeah, yeah. And what we found is that the pneuma that he described 2,000 years ago is nitric oxide. So we call our company Pneuma Nitric Oxide. Oh, we are okay. the breath of life. But it's funny, we just had this podcast, we were talking about that because circulation came up on another company. And I was explained to him where that word came from, circulation. It's the circle. And for 2,000 years, it was thought that it was the pneuma theory. Yeah. And um, that's how the arms moved and everything. And um, uh, Harvey, Harvey. Oh, yeah. 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 So he found that in the 1600s. And and, and that's another seminal moment and its viewpoint. He puts the magnification on, sees the artery bring the blood down, Sees the, uh, the uh, vein bringing it back, but couldn't see the connection. As soon as you see the connection, it's like Dellen's wow. epiphany. Yes. Well, duh. And he goes, well, there's the completion of the circle. It's system. Which, and it's a circle, Denial. which is circulation. Mm-hmm. Now, I came to that conclusion way past out of school, and I was telling people, when you're in school, you're not asked for your opinion. <laughs> You're asked to regurgitate. <laughs> and I, there's so many words that I just regurgitate, like the BH word with folic acid. And I'm, I'm reading on deep dive on that folic acid. It comes from foliage. Uh, oh, well, that makes sense. Circulation is the circle. Cir- yeah. I mean, when you get down, it's, it's so simple. So simple, but such complexity. And that's why it's confusing. That's right. Guys, I, this has been a great, great discussion. Dr. Um, Jacoby, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks uh, for all you do. You've made thank you. enormous advances in, in metabolism and, and yeah, I mean, compression surgery. And we'll, we'll have another talk. Matter of fact, I'm deep into the stem cell world. Um, been to Dr. Reardon's clinic in Panama. I've seen the autistic kids treated there. I was just recently in, in um, Puerto Vallarta in uh, the Dream Body Clinic is another great clinic. And there are lots of great clinics, but you can't do some of that stuff in the United States. Because it works. Because that, it, cause it does work. And that's a whole other issue, and it's a shame. But the stem cells, and I was telling Dr. Reardon this, I mean, if, if, if you don't have the, the circulation, you're having patients go through this therapy and they say, this stuff doesn't work. No, it that's does. Right. It That's does right. work. Well, it, here's the you're taking sick cells from sick patients and putting them back in sick patients. Yeah. So how do we how do we clean sense. up the terrain? How do we open up the highway from a two lane road to a four lane road? That's exactly. what nitric oxide does. So if you're taking autologous stem cells or exosomes or from umbilical products, then you have to take the nitric oxide, open up the blood vessels so that they can actually be delivered to the ischemic hypoxic tissue where the dysfunction is. We have to have We're it. brothers from another mother. I mean, you know that? Fun, it <laughs> makes <laughs> fundamental sense, but yet it's just. It's the application of the knowledge. Well, this is a big story that has to be told. So when I was in Panama, a lot of autistic kids there, and this is a weird story. So I'm in the cafeteria, and they were there from everywhere, Africa, India, whatever, but they all looked the same because of that physiologic difference, and they ate the same. They they guarded their food. They looked left to right. They were eating sugar, and you could tell. They were just gobbling it up. So I went up to this one lady and I said, is this the first time you're in the clinic here? He said, no, this is my third time. I said, third time? Why would you tell me the story? She says, well, he cannot speak. He was about 13, 14. Cannot speak. We come down. He gets IV infusion of stem cells. And Dr. Reardon used uh, cultured, expanded umbilical tissue. And when we leave, he can speak. And I don't know why I said this. I said, what did he say? <laughs> I don't know why. And he said, I want a donut. Oh, gosh. 
I said, well, there's your answer. I said, you read a copy of my book. She got angry with me and obviously had plenty of money. I'm going to come here every year and I'm going to give him whatever he wants. And I'm thinking, oh, this kid could be cured. And the further that process goes on, Alzheimer's, autism, doesn't matter what it is, that nerve, every time you eat sugar, it gets fibrosed. Inflammation turns into fibrotic scar tissue. And at some point, you're not going to be able to unravel that scar tissue. And that's where the surgery comes in. And that's what I tried to tell Dr. Dellen. You know, he's a professor of neurosurgery. You know, I'm, that's, he does surgery. I'm a cl- clinician in, the mar- in, in Scottsdale. If I see 100 patients with diabetic neuropathy, 99 of them are small fiber. Mm-hmm. They need change of diet, nitric oxide, oxide. And some other things, exercise, and it'll get better. Or maybe stem cells before surgery. So... I'm thrilled with this conversation. I don't know why we didn't meet before, probably because I didn't go to the last couple of meetings (laughs) because I brought this whole concept to them in 2011. I was literally... Which one, the extremity nerve surgeons? Yeah. Yeah. And I brought uh, Dr. Cook. um, If I had known you, I'd have brought you. um, Dr. Hayden Hamlin from Harvard uh, with the... Michael uh, Hamlin? Yeah. 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 Uh, With the lasers, lasers, now now LED. Who else did I have? Um, neurosurgeon uh, from um, UCLA, uh, Filler, Aaron Filler. Now he can measure that with um, MR neurography. He's a guy you ought to, if you're doing experiments and you want to see that physical change. Yeah, look at nerve, nerve conductance velocity. This is no, beyond that. Really with the MRIs. It's wow. amazing. Um, and there's a lot of people out there. Martin Paul, he's a biochemist. Yeah. You guys could, um, you know, stay up in the middle of the night talking about this stuff. He's um, from Johns Hopkins originally. Then he's taught at Washington State University. His theory is that electromagnetic force, cell phones, can change the physiology of the nerve and cause the uh, calcium ions to be dispersed. Sure, yeah. And he likes the term perioxynitrite, so he thinks that's a big part of it. I don't think he gets your depth of knowledge, and if you two sat down and you would say, oh, my God, we're yeah, talking. Yeah, we've had, we've had uh, discussions and conversations at conferences we both spoke at. Uh, the proxynitrite story has not played out as he anticipated because uh, it's O-O-N-O minus. Right? Yeah. It's a cage-like molecule that rearranges to inorganic nitrate, NO3 minus. So... And it's, it's one of the protective mechanisms of nitric oxide because it scavenges superoxide. And when NO reacts with superoxide, it forms OONO minus. So it neutralizes this radical radical reaction and it rearranges to inorganic nitrate. So the whole proxy nitrite field is, is riddled with misinterpretation of data. And the, so, so I don't argue with the nitration of proteins from, from something that's causing tyrosine nitration on proteins. You can pick this up on, on histology or pathology. But the analogy is the cops always show up at a crime scene, right? But the cops didn't cause the crime. <coughs> Just because nitric oxide is present or nitric oxide metabolites are present in pathology doesn't mean that it contributed to the pathology. Nitric oxide is always going to be there because it's part of the immune response. It's part of the body's way to mitigate the inflammatory response. So don't blame the cops for the crime that occurred before they got there. I say the same thing. I say... Ambulances do not cause cardiac disease. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so the, the, look, the whole nitric oxide field is, is riddled with misinterpretation. And so you can find whatever you want, you're looking for in the literature. And that's the problem. And it's kind of been my... But we need op- to get guys like you and him and it, it need an open debate. And, and even the surgical... Now, Dellen is not really into the biochemistry of this process. He, you know, he's strictly a surgeon, but... If 99% of the patients I see are from the biochemistry of the, of the autonomic nervous system, that's, yeah. not, a, that's not a surgical. Yeah, not a surgical intervention yeah. yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll meet again. Absolutely. Thanks all right. for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.